Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our roundtable guests. Professor Dr. Sheila Blumen. She is full professor and main researcher at the Pontifical Catholic University of Peru, PUCP, and author of numerous book chapters and scientific articles. Furthermore, she is specialized in working with highly able children, director of the foundation Future Minds, and carries out consultancies for the Ministry of Education and institutions interested in the development of creativity and talent as a strategy for innovation and development. Please also welcome Dr. Narayan Desai, who graduated as an ecologist and has a doctorate in the restoration of ecology, plus another one in Vedic and Puranic literature. He is the founder of Tribal Mensa Nurturing Program in India, which is an emerging chapter of Mensa International and is an initiative working to identify and nurture gifted children among tribal population in India. Please also welcome Kondo Mutulai Muli, who was born and raised in Kenya. His father was an extremely successful entrepreneur and later became a celebrated philanthropist. Nondo works as a board director for the Muli Children's Family Canada, which is a registered Canadian charity committed to supporting the rescue and rehabilitation programs of Muli Children's Family in Kenya. And last but not least, please welcome Professor Dr. Janos Gyuri, who is a full professor at Ötvös Loránd University Budapest, Hungary. Here he is working for the Faculty of Education and Psychology, Institute for Intercultural Psychology and Education. In the last 10 years, he collected data in detail on more than 30 talent development programs all over the world and published about these programs in three volumes in Hungarian and English. He is going to be the moderator of the roundtable discussion titled Talent Management Practices for Children in Extreme Poverty and Risk. So welcome everybody. Uh, our guest uh, is uh, Professor Dr. Shaila Blumen, Dr. Narayan Desai, and Dondo Mutuamulli. And uh, the topic what we are talking about today in this round table is, let me say, a demanding topi uh, topic uh, because uh, uh, we are talking about uh, gifted students who live and grow up uh, in extreme poverty and danger. I tell you some uh, example from this. Uh, for you, it will be familiar, but maybe not for all the audiences. They are the children. Uh, uh, who grew up on the streets, so it's street children, orphan children, abandoned children, abused children, uh, physically and sexually as well. Children from junior environments, homes and government rehabilitation centers, child laborers, children with serious physical disabilities, destitute children, child mothers, ex-commercial sex workers, HIV infected and affected children, and children living in war zones. So this is not the typical population uh, which about we used to talk uh, in our conferences, uh, because this is not the children who lag behind, I mean the family lags behind, uh, not the children who grow up in some kind of needs, but these are children in serious uh, uh, danger and in serious life circumstances. And uh, today we try to talk about uh, the ways we can support them uh, in gifted education programs. Uh, so let me ask you at first about your professional career, about your work at home. Uh, and please, uh, uh, in this first round, uh, don't uh, mention your main program. Naturally, we will talk about those programs later. So who starts? Maybe, maybe in alphabetic order, I mean the family names, uh, Shaila, uh, you can start. Okay. Thank you so much. Well, hello, everyone. I'm honored to be part of this important panel and appreciate the invitation very much. I'm Sheila Blumen, professor of psychology 
an editor-in-chief of the Academic Journal of Psychology at my university, which is the Pontifical Catholic University in Peru. Along my professional career, I've been linked to the field of education, first as an elementary teacher. I taught reading and mathematics in elementary school, and afterwards as a social science middle school teacher. Since the beginning of my practice as a licensed psychologist, I was involved in psychoeducational assessments, both for Peruvian and international population. We have a, an important uh, group of migrants here in Peru coming from different Latin American countries. And uh, also with the development of teacher training programs and counseling programs for students with special learning needs. That's how I entered the field of uh, gifted dedication. As a researcher, I lead a research group called Crea Talentum, focus on creativity, technology, and talent development. Also, I collaborate as a consultant for the Ministry of Education in my country and professor and invited professor in different uh, universities. Um, as a mother, I have seen uh, the need to include intervention services for the gifted in the general stream of education, and I think that was my main motto to enter also the public service. Um, yeah, I'm not going to talk about <laughs> uh, what I do in gifted education, so I think I have given kind of a broadened spectrum from all the different hats I may have along my daily life. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. That is perfect for the starting point. And uh, I think Narayan, you could come because in the alphabetic order, you are the next one. Well, thanks. Uh, I appreciate for this invitation. We have a little bit of time in Corona, so I'm sitting at home and you can see my kitchen behind. So <laughs> this is my office. But um, uh, I am a basically ecologist and uh, working in a jungle and forest, um, I come across a lot of tribal schools and uh, I am a part and I have started one tribal school and that is my journey getting into giftedness. 2002, I have conducted an a intelligent test into my, sacri uh, my tribal school. I work with the different, different communities, but basically being an ecologist, I travel a lot across country. And uh, I thought that, and I was thinking earlier that uh, there are a lot of gifted kids roaming around in the streets and uh, forest area. And if we can identify them and do something for them, it will be good. But as you see, I'm not an academician. I'm not a psychologist, but uh, probably you can call me an amateur person working in this field for the last 26 years. Thanks. Thank you so very much. But uh, as far as I know, you have a doctorate. So in which field did you get your doctorate? I got a, my PhD in uh, restoration ecology. And my second PhD is in Vedic ecology in Sanskrit. So I see. So not only one, but two doctorates you have. <laughs> if you don't have a job, you can keep on doing education. So probably. <laughs> Yes, and high achievement in itself. And, uh, and Dondo, uh, you can come. Please introduce yourself and your work in general. Um, my name is Dondo Muli, and I am so privileged to be here. Thank you for the invitation. It's an honor to be here today, uh, all the way from uh, Kenya. And um, I am basically an administrator. My base is on administration and management. That is what I did. Uh, and um, in my undergraduate, I did community development and I did uh, also uh, uh, management, business management. So I've been involved in various uh, cadres and various uh, levels in policy making in our country and also in uh, various platform, religious platforms and uh, being able to help out uh, in decision making. Other than that, what I do for Muli Children's Family, that is where I work. I work as an operations um, uh, director and uh, therein I also did my uh, master's and in human resource uh, management and also strategic management. So uh, that shifted me a lot 
in another platform or another space whereby we have organizations uh, all over the country in Kenya that mainly basically deal with uh, with uh, ch children issues in the country. It's called Area Advisory Council, all the way it goes to the National Advisory Council. So I work with these councils. I work uh, very closely also with um, uh, Christian uh, organizations that uh, need help in one way or another. So I'm very pleased to, to be here today and share uh, my experience in, in, in this space. Thank you. Yes, and we are also very happy to be with you. And uh, uh, just I tell some personal information that with Sheila, we met in many, many places in Hungary, in Peru, so in our countries as well. And uh, 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 with the others, we met in conferences and uh, uh, different professional circumstances. Uh, so this is the way we know each other personally. And uh, I think we could uh, continue with you, Ndondo. And the next question, please uh, introduce Kenya. Naturally, we all know something, this and those things about Kenya. But please uh, introduce the population, introduce the um, uh, sociological aspect, from sociological aspect, the population as well. As, uh, introduce, please, the education in general and gifted education in Kenya in general, not your program, but in general. OK. Thank you so much. And I love my country. It is Kenya. And Kenya is actually located in East Africa. And we have the equator that just divides Kenya right in the middle. Kenya is, has very many different um, uh, climate uh, settings. And we have from very dry areas to very uh, lush green areas. And Kenya is known for its beautiful uh, national parks. We have all kinds of animals. We have the big five animals. So this is an invitation for all of you when Corona is all done, mm -hmm. that you can always come to Kenya. Our general population, according to the census that were done in 2019, is that we have a population of about uh, 47.5 million people. And out of all this, it's really diverse in terms of uh, when you look at the social aspect or the economical aspect of Kenya. Unfortunately, we have almost uh, 80, 86 um, percent of all Kenyans live below uh, $5.5 a day. So it is really a country that has that translates to about uh, 39 or so Kenyans live in abject poverty. So you find that the poverty level in Kenya has uh, caused a lot of uh, problems in that that's why you have all these vulnerable groups that are um, uh, present because of poverty levels. We have children, as you have mentioned, we have orphans, we have street children, teenage mothers, destitutes. We have um, people living with uh, disabilities, elderly people, people living with HIV and AIDS, you know, and all these things. And people also live, as I said, Kenya has a very diverse uh, climate. And there are places whereby there is abject uh, drought, there is continuous drought. And all these things end up um, making Kenya have a very high prevalence of poverty. And when it comes to um, uh, the needs that are there, or uh, what kind of poverty, why, what really drives people to, to this uh, kind of poverty, or what is happening around there, you find that there are so many people who cannot access uh, proper health care. And especially now with the COVID-19, our, our health sector has been really, really challenged to handle um, you know, the number of people who are sick. And as we speak right now, our ICUs are all you know, over, over stretched. And uh, you find that the healthcare system is one that has been worked on by our government, but you find that not so many people can afford, um, you know, healthcare. Not so many people are able to afford uh, education, proper education. 
We find that there are children who are dropping out of school. So there are people who are illiterate and you find natural calamities, there is drought. We had locusts right now in Kenya, we have a problem with locusts. And at the same time, there are areas that are suffering out of drought. And a few months before uh, the corona came, we had floods. So these natural calamities are the ones partly are responsible in putting the big fraction of Kenyans into the poverty level that we have. When it comes to the social aspects, because of the frustrations, and if, when you look at the index and the rates that are there currently, because of 20, 2020 uh, corona, a lot of people lost their jobs. What did that translate to? Depression, alcoholism, you know, abuse. Children have been, we've had the highest number of teenage pregnancies in Kenya ever before. Broken marriages, unemployment, all these things are causing our country, Kenya, to really uh, be in a desperate condition. Now, when it comes to the gifted, um, the no mode of education in Kenya, we have a very robust um, uh, system. And we were talking before, we were saying the, the corona has really changed a lot of education systems. I guess it's all around the world. There's a demand. But however, Kenya's mainly focus is, is very academic. And uh, it's called the 844 system. But we are grateful to our government that right now they have changed since 2017. There are people who are spearheading uh, the new curriculum. It is called the competence-based curriculum. The competence-based curriculum, it's the one that is going to, um, we, we see there's a space, we see there's an opportunity for young people to develop their talents, for young people to be, be, develop giftedness, because that is the avenue. In the 844 system, before we didn't have that space whereby people can, or uh, young people or children can develop their gifts. And therefore, at the moment, uh, there is little that is going on, but there is a little effort. And you find that uh, there are programs that are being currently developed to uh, gear up or to help in the giftedness and the talent education development. And I will say that um, when it comes to, to, to some people, for example, there's a lady I know, uh, she's called Molly uh, Gao. She writes even for the giftedness and talent. And uh, she is from the Ministry of Education. People like those ones, individuals, pers individual persons, who are spearheading, who are working hard to ensure that there's, there's a reality in, in that, that there's giftedness and there's talent development education that can be entrenched in our current uh, programs. But as at now, only the very affluent um, uh, schools have this uh, setting that of, of encouraging children and young people to develop, develop their skills and to develop their uh, talents. Thank you very much. Thank you also very much for this very comprehensive picture of your country population, education and gifted education. And now I am pleased to uh, introduce uh, India in this sense. If, if it is possible to introduce India as a huge continental uh, country, uh, well, I want to just uh, uh, make a little bit more clarification that India's, the main uh, name of this nation is Bharat. And uh, it is a Sanskrit word and it says Bha means knowledge and Rata means people who wonder in knowledge. So this is a country of people who have vast knowledge and uh, um, Talking about, I'm talking about 1.3 billion people and Corona also has a big impact on us, but there are very positive sides of Corona, which we have uh, seen in this last one year, a lot of volunteerism. Uh, my program of giftedness has received more donations than earlier years. So people are said, okay, you are doing good job and education is a big thing and people are investing and donating. Um, if talking about India, we have more than 450 languages registered. There are more, more than 4,000 dialects. You know India is a diverse country with all 
climatic zones and different types of forest. It's a more colorful uh, country. 80% uh, of the population is a rural area and uh, somewhat uh, you can say that they are in a poverty, below poverty and above poverty line. But uh, last 10 years of good administration of Mr. Prime Minister of current Prime Minister, a lot of things have been changed, a lot of money and economic infrastructure facilities have been at grassroots level. Um, unfortunately, the producer of this country is underprivileged and the person who is a uh, consumer is a privilege. So we are trying to work on that dynamics where the farmer is become privileged and he gets more money so that he can lift his thing and the country will get a good thing. The kind of poverty, uh, the reason is poverty is basically the political will. And uh, we were, most of the countries, like other countries, we were the politically colonized uh, country. And uh, uh, I can tell you in 18th century, 36% of world GDP was from India. And now because we are the poorest, uh, we became poorest because of colonial rules and other things. Talking about uh, uh, de definition of development in, uh, in India, uh, there were two big approach. One was Mahatma Gandhi's approach, making village self-sustainable, which was the, one of the best approach one should take. But there was a Western influence on that time, the prime minister and we adopted Western model of development, like industries and all those things. So the the villages got uh, separated from the main development uh, program. Uh, what is the reason for poverty? It's basically not having a good share of natural resources or there is no equality in sharing of the resources. Um, that you can consider education, infrastructure or other facilities also there is unequal sharing and that leads to the more of uh, poverty things. Education system, still we follow colonial way of uh, education system where Britishers want us to be uh, clerks and office bearers. So still India was, India is in that condition where we are getting a good education. We are good in English speaking. We are good in maths. We are good in sciences. But we don't have entrepreneurs because we have not taught to be entrepreneurs. We have to be servants. But this thing is changing. And we talk about gifted education program. For centuries to centuries, India has a lot of big gifted programs. It in classical dance, classical music. You talk about folk songs and recipes. And those that traditional system of gifted education was called Gurukula, where student is staying in teacher's home, do all the work and he get lessons from the teacher. Uh, still in India, in South India, you can see traditional Gurukula where a master who is living in a poverty or low income, but having 10, 15 students at his home and he teaches traditional knowledge. So uh, India has a very good gifted program earlier Talking about the regular gifted program in academic sense, uh, after the independence, Indian government has really worked on giftedness program. They have best engineering and medical colleges and infrastructures, uh, IITs and uh, management schools. Uh, but this is for high elite people. And then government came up with a concept of reservations so that the underprivileged kids will get some seats into those education system and uh, they can have their development. But uh, still more or less all these big academic institutions for gifted, uh, science gifted or maths gifted or other gifted, they, have, they are for higher society. Um, for underprivileged, uh, this one, the giftedness program is not existing and that is what I have started last 22 years uh, because these entire underprivileged community is being treated as servants, you know, helpers, laborers. So education is not a priority to them. And 
certainly the program which we have started and now government has taken up in their own government schools giftedness program but still it is in maths and science so it is more on performance based not in what uh, other participants said about skill set uh, on the basis of skill set so this is the basic uh, um, we have some uh, professional way uh, giftedness programs running uh, but they are hard, costly um, the cambridge university and oxford university and lot of international universities are coming with their own giftedness program in india and you have like maths talent and science talents but again the cost and uh, the ratio is very different uh, but it gives only uh, opportunity for privileged uh, community so this is the basic scenario of india yes thank you very much and we will talk about your own program and what is the difference uh, uh, with your program compared to the other uh, indian programs later but at first i call uh, shaila to talk about uh, uh, peru and the situation in your country thank you yana um i would like to share my screen so i'm going to share a screen with you so that uh, i can i think visually things help to be understood. Uh, well, Peru is right here in South America, you know, and we are a country that has been enriched by different migration waves. This is important why I know many countries have received different migration waves, but in Peru particularly, this has, the situation has shaped also the country. So um, we have descendants from Western Europeans, also Eastern Europeans, African people also from Japan and China mainly, I mean, from, from Eastern um, countries. So uh, also Peru has a, I, I would say, significant challenge in geography. We have the Amazon rainforest over here we have the highlands of the Andean mountains here, and also we have a highly desertic coast, okay, close to the Pacific Ocean. If you see this configuration, geographical configuration related to the ethnic linguistic diversity from American natives, okay, because people um, that are descendant from migrants are mainly in the coastal area. But what's going on in the Andes and in the Amazon jungle, the Amazon jungle um, used to have more than 80 different, not as many as India, of course, but 80 different native ethnic linguistic groups. And we have several of them also in the Andean mountains. If you compare this Peruvian ethnic linguistic map to the one related to population rate, you can see that this is a highly centralized country. Peruvian population is only 32.97 million inhabitants from which 10.7 are in Lima. So you can understand how the country is configured, highly centralized, all the important decisions take place uh, here in Lima, okay? And if you compare the areas where you don't have much population, the lower population is also related to the jungle areas, to the Amazon areas. And if we see the poverty of the monetary, because there are different types of poverty, right? The monetary poverty map, you can see that most of the poverty wealth is related also to the Amazon jungle with, of course, some areas, important areas, in the Andean mountains, in the Andean highlands. So this comparison, this comparative maps give you some idea about, for instance, the poverty rate in the Amazon rainforest, that it's up to 25.8%. In the island Andean highlands, it's about 29.3%, and in the desertic coast, 13.8%. We have improved, if we can say that, in terms of the evolution of the total monetary poverty index. Uh, until 2019, uh, 2018, I would say 2019, of course, before Corona, right? Because uh, nowadays the situation is 
pretty difficult. So this poverty and extreme poverty conditions have also shaped the society, the Peruvian society. First of all, we have many challenges. We have the climate challenge that Ndanga has already mentioned in terms of floodings. We have terrible floodings and we're never enough prepared for them. Okay, and, uh, and these floodings, you know, they have a significant impact, not just for the country in economical terms, but of course for educational terms uh, for the children, because they, they tend to lose school, they lose classes. And uh, also we have a desertic area in which you don't have crops, right? So uh, then you have hunger in those areas as well. So climate change is a reality in Peru. We are losing water. Our highlands in the Andes are losing uh, snow. They used to be white mountains, and now they are black or brown mountains. So no snow anymore. And this is significant affecting also the water that comes to, towards the coast. So the coast is becoming much more desertic than before. And uh, the water and food provisions, what I was talking about, are highly related to the climate cha change <laughs> challenges. Uh, our demographic tendencies are uh, already going up. I mean, the situation is worsened. And here, the problem is also with uh, the religious beliefs and the, re the religious extremist groups, because uh, of course, science and scientific and academy uh, wants to include policies that would somehow uh, control some demographic tendencies, but then there are also religious uh, perspectives. And, and, and here the church is very important and, and has a lot of power in terms of political terms. So um, there is an ongoing conflict depending on who is in the political power at that time. We have transnational crimes. You know, we're the number one country producing coca. So um, this is a big issue because students, I mean, children, youth that cannot find their way through education can easily or think they can easily find their way through trans transnational crimes. And, and this is a very terrible situation because if you make, um, you make a study in terms of vocational orientation, many of uh, students from, let's say, seventh, eighth graders, or even fourth or five, fifth grade, uh, when you ask them, what would you like to become when you're an adult, they would tell you a sicario. Can you imagine that sicario is a, 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 not the drug dealer, is the person who is um, uh, giving protection to drug dealers. Okay, the one that wears the guns and are protecting them. And, and, and everybody tells you, yeah, they earn a lot of money, so why not? So there is a crisis in terms of moral and values because that's the reality and the context can shape also the children if they don't have a proper you know, way or, or a space in their school. So education is the only thing that could really um, save the children. Also, we have poverty and, of course, external debt, right? With, I'm not going to repeat all the challenges and all the factors related to monetary poverty and also gender issues, okay? As Nandra has already mentioned and also Narayan. So I, I don't want to repeat what you have already said, but definitely we are a highly fragmented country, socially, economically, geographically, and this is also affecting significantly communication among the population, national identity, health and well-being, violence rates. We're, one, we're, I think, the second country with domestic violence in the studies of UNESCO. And uh, this is very dramatic for us. So we're doing some things about this. And in gender studies, there is already a lot of things to do. So we're not uh, particularly in well um, position. Well, this is, I just wanted to show you uh, uh, how education is in Peru. As I've mentioned, we have around 32 million or 
well, going to 33 million of the population. Compulsory education is along 11 years that started in kindergarten in the preschool year. Kindergarten is compulsory. Go through primary education up to 11th grade of secondary education. We have only 11th grades in the regular school uh, curriculum, in regular um, schooling. And the academic years goes from March to December. We have a system from 0 to 20 that is a grading, our grading system, and we have easily comparative, you know, comparisons to international and U.S. also um, grading systems. In terms of our uh, general stream, we have uh, now there is a education law that wants to put also compulsory from three-year-old program, but th that's already in, under discussion. Why? Because we know the importance of preschool years. And if the children are, I mean, if compulsory education starts in five years, then you have two, three years that have been lost because they don't receive any other support. So uh, it is important to include preschool years as a whole uh, in compulsory education. And then uh, secondary education, they can be related to uh, formal secondary education or technical school. Sometimes particularly poor children or children living in rural areas, after primary education, they start the basic level of technical school because they can think, I'm not going to go up to secondary education looking for a college degree because I cannot afford it, or, or, or they see it as a very, very far away goal, okay, and, 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 and reachable goal, really. So they, they um, choose to go to basic technical school. If some of them, they, they um, step down to regular secondary education and go to the middle level of technical school, so this is also another option for secondary education. And post-secondary, we have college level or post-secondary technical institutes as well. So this is more or less how education in Peru is shaped. In terms of um, the services we have for uh, the highly able, there was a whole issue going on, but I can tell this is one of my goals that I, I, I really uh, got to 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 achieve, which is um, the, the formation of, of the course, which are academies for art and sciences, for the highly able coming from extreme poverty conditions. They were initially thought for extreme poverty conditions, then they changed to poverty conditions, because we have 20% of our population is under poverty conditions, and 2 3% now is under extreme poverty. So instead of entering in this discussion about who is poor, who is more poor, etc., uh, we chose to, to focus this on this 20% of the poverty condition. And uh, they started the first one in Lima in 2010 after different, I can tell, different presidents, different governments. Now we have 25 cores, one per region. Every region has a core. And uh, and we have developed uh, in, an interesting system for identifying them and, of course, considering all what Janos has already uh, talked about in terms of the conditions in which children, usually poor children, um, are rising up, right? So these are some pictures of the core, and I think I'll... I'll Stay yeah. just here. Yes, I don't want to to go ahead. Yes, because and, later yeah. I'm I'm gonna tell you about how the the, the system is for them. Okay. Yeah, yes, because now we can turn to your own uh, systems, uh, which is running <laughs> extreme uh, danger and poverty. I think now we could uh, start with Narayan and India. I think your program is really internationally very unique. So please introduce your program. Uh, who are the children in your program, what age uh, they are in, what kind of select, uh, 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 identification sorry, method you have, uh, and what do you uh, uh, use as a method for their uh, gifted development? Uh, well, my program name is 
tribal mensa nurturing program because it started in a, my tribal school in year 2002. I've, I've conducted a, a, a mensa test because being a mensan identified in 1978, I was a I was being identified and nurtured in first India's gifted school, that is Nyana Prabodhini, which is in Pune city. And uh, in year 2002, I started uh, conducting a Mensa test in my tribal school, and I was able to find four girls who became Mensans, scoring more than 98 percentile score. Uh, so basically, I use a, fig a figural non-verbal test, which is recognized by Mensa. And uh, in the last 10 years, I was using that. And recently, we have come up with our own indigenous test, uh, still based on its non-verbal figural uh, test. Uh, and um, so in year 2002, I identified four girls, and that has increased in 2007 to 64. And in 2020, uh, more than 40,000 students I have screened across country, and I got more than 3,500 students um, who are gifted. Um, so Tribal Mensa Nurturing Program is a special program. So what we do is we go to the school and we conduct uh, a Mensa test. And we screen the entire school. Uh, we do screening at the age of eighth grade. That is the when the kid is in 11th or 12th uh, of his age. And uh, the kids who scored more than 95 percentile score in Mensa test, we screen them as gifted. And when the, then we conduct pull-out program for those students. So in a school of a population of 500, 600 students, we get some more 30, 35 students as gifted. And um, uh, I'm talking about 600 students in one one grade. So there are five, six classrooms. Each classroom has more than 70 to 80 students. And then we screen the entire population and we get those many students. Uh, in ninth standard, we do a nurturing program. And this is what the typical tribal Mensa uh, highlight is. Uh, we have developed a indigenous nurturing program based on Sanskrit ancient knowledge literature. So we have come up with different, different activities and we conduct 12 workshops uh, year round in ninth grade. And then in 10th grade, the, when the kid comes, he has to sit for a very competitive state level uh, examination. And so they are busy preparing that during that time, uh, Tribal Mensa Nurturing Program conducts study skill workshops. So mostly the kids are gifted kids are afraid of performance. They are not able to perform in academic career. And that is what I have seen in my last 25 years of career in giftedness that you can call a person as gifted, but his academic performance is not to the standard in basically in underprivileged because as he is gifted, he is emotionally weak and other problems he has in family. So that reflects into his academic performance. So what we do is we give study skill workshops in his 10th grade, and then we give a career counseling, one-to-one -one counseling, psychological counseling, as well as career counseling to the gifted kid. And they said, okay, you are gifted, you have been nurtured, and this is the career which you can choose and you can be successful. So this is what the basically the tribal nurturing program uh, we conduct. Um, uh, more on that, we have developed a lot of material in this uh, gifted nurturing program. So we are not focusing on academic nurturing. We are the total program is non-academic. So we focus more on skill sets rather than is, is he good in mathematics or is he good in science? We, we don't bother about that. He can perform in his science and maths that is immaterial to us. But mm -hmm. is he able to do more observations? Is he able to raise more questions? 
like for example our nurturing programs has like we give a small leaf and ask them to make observations and this tribal and underprivileged gifted kids more do more than 500 observation of that leaf so that is the skill set what they have and then i we show them okay, okay this is what your brain is working this is what the gift you have so can you use that observation skill or questioning skill to your profession or your career and then you can grow uh, in here this one so these are 12 workshops we have spread out into this more than 123 psychological parameters attributes we take care of in this nurturing program mostly the nurturing program are in the school campus and that is what we have a restrictions we don't have a, a typical infrastructure where we bring them into one place and do the mm -hmm. so we go to the school and we do those programs last three years we are focusing more on girls and uh, uh, we have more uh, exclusive program for girls called Wama. Wama is a Sanskrit name for girls. Uh, we believe that if girls can get educated, she uh, will help two families. One is mother's family and as well as the husband's family. So with one uh, investment, you get two things, you know, one, one to one, three. So that is why we have seen for last five to eight years, the sincerity in the girls being to prove themselves as gifted and prove them that they are doing good is more than the boys. Uh, I think what uh, other countries, same experience we have, most of the kids are going for quick money. So very uh, shady work they want to go for that and a lot of things, bad things they get into. So. That is what the nurturing program uh, uh, Tribal Mensa is doing for the last 25 years. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, this is really a very, very valuable program. I know the program in some more details as well. Uh, maybe later we can go into those details as well. But now I would like to uh, 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 ask you, Don uh, Dondo, uh, can we say uh, that the program in which you are is a kind of family program for these children or this is something different just started by a family okay thank you Jana and uh, for the opportunity I'm very excited when I talk about Muli children's family and uh, if it's okay I will share just a bit on my screen uh, just to explain and as um, sorry I have so many things happening uh, I'm not very good at this, but um, yeah, okay. Can you see my screen now? Yes, yes. Uh... Yes. Um, well, the Muli Children's Family is in, in Kenya, as I said, and then it is, um, it was founded in 1989 by... Excuse me, Charles sorry, Muli. sorry, sorry, just for a minute. Is it possible to put it full screen, please? Did we lose your, uh, uh, her voice or? Sorry? Uh, sorry, I had the impression that we lost your voice and uh, can you put uh, 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 the slides on the slideshow mode because then it is bigger, the slide. Oh. Be yes, because then it is easier oh, to, oh, now it is perfect. Okay. And then I don't have power. <laughs> oh, I see. Yes, it can happen, unfortunately, but uh, but uh, uh, do you think that uh, we could continue with Shayla and then come back to you or how quickly uh, this? Yes, because I have power breakout. I, I don't have, I have a power, uh, what is it called? I uh, see. Blackout right now. Yes, yes. Thank yes. you very much. It also sees, uh, shows in itself how difficult <laughs> circumstances sometimes uh, you yes. work. But Shayla, then we can uh, uh, turn okay. to Peru and uh, we will come back to uh, the Kenya uh, program, which is very interesting program. So what can we learn uh, from you about the program in Peru for this uh, special population? But yeah, um, I, I would say that the, um, as a researcher also, because I have, as I've told at the beginning, different hats, a practitioner and also researcher, our studies on gifted children in the Andean and Amazon region had led us to consider giftedness as a social construct. 
and highly dependent on cultural and developmental factors, as well as on educational opportunities, of course. As we have just seen what happened to Dondo, imagine if we were in a school, right? Suddenly electricity went out. So those children are not having the same opportunities from schools that might have an electrical generator, for instance, right? As Narayan was saying in terms of the differences that we have in our countries, in terms of those who are attending more affluent schools, right? Or come from affluent families, so they have enriched opportunities comparing to others. So we need to restrain our need to frame a narrow one size fits all conception of giftedness towards a dynamic one shaped by the values and concepts and attitudes and the language of the culture. In multicultural contexts where poverty conditions are inherent to native populations, as happens in my country, students who perceive greater obstacles during acculturation are much more sensitive to social exclusion, and we have seen that. So challenging experiences in acculturation may lead to heightened reactivity also to socially hurtful events. So this is now um, the way we are approaching to gifted education is not uh, considering like, okay, let's have an institute and let all children come to our institute, but because they would also demand us uh, a, a, a significant budget. So what we do is work with what we have which means Ministry of Education so that we can reach a broadened spectrum of children as well. And in this sense, I would like to share my screen in order to tell you uh, what we have found that works. So first of all, advocacy strategies. And for advocacy strategies, we have, um, we are working, yes, with the Ministry of Education, but also with the public schools, particularly to, with those schools that are recognized as having very good practices in, in terms of pedagogical. Also with our network, we have Templeton community, Narayan, I met Narayan as a Templeton fellow 10 or it's going to be 11 years ago. ECHA is a very good network uh, space as well, ETSN, World Council, etc. So we, we also are very related to the colleagues in our network in order to help us uh, sometimes with information, sometimes with some advice, etc., or with interchange as well, because belonging to a university or academic settings also allow you to have interchange for research purposes. Also, as an Eisenhower Fellow, um, I can reach private foundations that can also uh, give us, and of course, uh, doing advocacy work with them. Whatever, you never know when you will, there is an opportunity in order to support whatever you want to do. So we are, we are having this kind of umbrella of different activities in advocacy. Uh, advocacy terms, and also, of course, mentoring practices and peer mentoring, which we um, are uh, launching in, at my university as well. Because at least in Peru, we, we feel that gifted students should be sensitive towards cultural differences, culturally diverse. Uh, they have to know and, and, and to, to develop these uh, skills in order to uh, work in collaborative groups, culturally diverse. Also, they need to be, uh, to have adaptation skills towards cultural differences and be sensitive to justice and equity issues. Equity issues are particularly significant in relation to giftedness. For instance, since last year, we're dealing with the budget of the Ministry of Education that was initially related to this course that now they want to change it to rural schools. I mean, we cannot discuss or go into this discussion that uh, rural schools do not need the budget. Of course they need it. But why taking away the budget of a program that is functioning very good with demagogical terms and not really with evidence? We have evidence from the course. And if you speak up, to the general population and you tell, oh, we need that money to be placed in rural schools. Of course, rural schools need, but you need also a program, a project that uh, really, that a sustainable project 
that, that really shows that this is going to work. Otherwise, what is happening dramatically in our countries is when somebody takes the budget from one program, it never goes back, right? And, 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 and never reaches where they want to put it anyway, because rural, as you have seen, is really challenging. And uh, we followed Ford and Wheaton standards of cultural competence as well. Indeed, uh, at the cores, they follow these standards in order to organize their um, well-being programs inside the cores. Okay, so this, these are the standards they follow. Also, in terms of richer, uh, another thing that works for us is research and training. We have a very significant exchange program with the Netherlands. And our students go to the Netherlands and their students come to us and they're really helpful because they support us with the peer mentoring. In our intervention programs, we are participating in the identification of the eighth graders attending the core schools. Core schools are nine, 10 and 11th grade. So why are we so focused on cultural sensitiveness? Because you can imagine how it is to place eighth grade, I mean, uh, ninth grader, because they are starting ninth grade, from all different ethnias coming from different backgrounds in a boarding school. They have to have to live together and do the daily activities. <clears throat> coming from very, very different backgrounds, it is very challenging. Okay, so this is why ninth grade is not just the grade in which it's kind of a transition from the public, regular public schools they were accustomed to attend towards the core schools, but also in terms of think about yourselves and make cognitive reflections as well in order to um, develop them skills to adapt among themselves with respect on the other's cultures and values as well. So uh, in our identification program, there are around 32,000 eighth graders that each year they um, uh, want to be part of the core, but there is all just 2,700 spaces for them all around the 25 cores in the country. So there are some things that need to be considered and given like a bonus point, which are economic poverty, monetary economic poverty, learning needs, uh, ethnic linguistic background, yes, native population gets a bonus point on this process. Uh, those populations coming from um, a reparation from armed conflict and also disabled conditions that could be motor, visual or auditory disabled conditions. So all these students that uh, uh, have one or, or more, right, of these conditions get bonus points in the whole identification process. I have, uh, this is already uh, documented in a just brand new uh, chapter in Conceptions of Giftedness and Talent that was released January this year. And uh, also we have with the private foundation, this is a bank foundation that are supporting the Young Scholars Program from the course. Uh, students finishing course and going to college, uh, private colleges. Otherwise, they would not be able to attend, you know, good quality of colleges. So we have uh, the financing part that uh, they provide the scholarships or the loans, it depends. Also, we have the talent developing program through tutoring and mentoring. And also, we support them, we monitor them in order to uh, to help with the job placement uh, process. Because what we have found is that it's not just that you uh, enrich the children and give them the educational opportunities, because finishing school, if they don't have the opportunity to attend college level, then they get lost. I mean, all, all whatever enrichment uh, you have given them, they particularly if they come from poverty context, they don't have the means and they don't have the connections in order to find loans or find grants. You need to help them. This is why we're supporting this. That's a national program 
for uh, grants and loans for these uh, students. And also when they finish college, they need some, particular in my country, I don't know how other countries, but uh, here as they see you, they treat you, right? And, and these this children or these young scholars or university students do not have the money to, to, to spend in, in, you know, expensive dresses and expensive clothing. And sometimes when you need to attend a job, in, um, how do you say, interview, as, particularly in certain areas, as they, you, you look, they treat you as you look. So what we do at the university setting is also giving them a sort of workshop and training in order for them to have the skills to uh, fulfill the requirements of the job interviews. And we have been quite successful on this, really. So we have now students, some of them continuing their studies abroad uh, in, in the best universities in the world. And that's a lot to say from children coming from, you know, highly disadvantaged conditions. So, and this is one of them, Madai. She entered MIT, Princeton, Berkeley, Columbia, Cornell, and Harvard to, go, uh, to, to continue um, her master and PhD studies. So now she's a Harvard student because Harvard was the university that provided them uh, her, you know, a full, uh, a complete grant. So, and, and the other um, activity that is important for us is teacher training, empowering teacher training is important. We have to look um, and focus on their teacher training since the beginning, since the undergraduate, and also including some metacognitive and thinking skills under training as well. Okay, oh, sorry. Yes. So they, um, I think I much, have said Sheila. a lot by thank now. They, I can't yes, but stop. we have seen all the slides, Shayla, and uh, thank you very much for the explanation and congratulations for uh, example this student of you really really amazing achievement and uh, Nundo can we say that your program in which you are involved is a family program or this is just a program which started with a family your family actually so what can we learn about your program in Kenya Oh, thank you, Yana, and I'm um, happy I'm back. The lights are back. <laughs> so sometimes when you get the, the blackout, um, once in a while we get them. So we are kind of used to it. I see. But we, thank, we are grateful for the opportunity. As you have asked, I will share my screen. I'll attempt to share my screen, and then uh, we, can, um, we can go on from there. Yes. Okay, um, Muli Children's Family is, is, we say we are the biggest family in the world because we are over, currently we have over 4,000 children who are under our care in almost seven different locations. And on top of that, we have had over, over 20,000 young people who have graduated in the last 30 years from Muli Children's Family and being successfully integrated into the communities. It was started by Dr. Charles Muli and his wife, uh, Esther Muli, who are very successful businessmen. And um, so when dad was very, he was, he's actually my father. I, I, I work for my parents and it, it's such a privilege to do that. It started in 1989, and that is uh, uh, Dr. Muli and uh, Mami Esther, mother and father to over 4,000 uh, children currently in MCF. And when Dr. Muli was young, when he was seven years old, he was abandoned by his parents. So he lived a life of abject poverty and abuse. He didn't have the, uh, um, the opportunity to go to school and he was a totally disadvantaged child. At 16 years old, uh, at 16 years old he wanted to, to commit suicide and die. And 
that is when he 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 got somebody who who preached to him he got salvation he became a christian and from there his life changed he started doing um, small small jobs he walked all the way to nairobi about uh, for for two days for three days he was walking to get a job in the big city he got a job and he was blessed to get a, a job and later on he became actually one of the millionaires back in the 80s back in the early 90s you know he was a millionaire he was a businessman and when he saw street children when he saw child mothers when he saw children who were neglected disadvantaged children he remembered his life he remembered himself where he was and therefore he called he got a calling his he, uh, from god and he stopped working he sold all his businesses and actually started bringing street children into his home he started bringing the first ones who are three and now we have over 20,000 who have gone through the program and currently uh, 4,000. 4, so that is uh, the reason why Muli Children's family became and why it's not, we don't call ourselves a home because we live as a family. And um, the, there, is a, there is a movie called The Muli Movie. You can see it in the mulimovie.com. It is actually for free. It will tell you all about Muli Children's Family, how it began and where we are at right now. What is our main objective or what drives us? Our main objective or our main vision is actually to see children and young people, people who are marginalized in the society, in the community, living a dignified life. So it really translates from Dr. Muli's own life where he was so disadvantaged and and he worked so hard and got himself into education and he got himself into business and he succeeded. And that is what he believes, that when you give anybody, it doesn't matter where they come from, if you give them a platform, a good environment, if you give them good mentors, good people around them, those people, no matter if they are children or adults, they'll be able to get that giftedness, that talent will naturally come out. And therefore, we rescue these children, impact them, give them all the talents that, they, I mean, help them discover their talents, their gifts, and then we reintegrate them back into, into the community. Who are we, who do we work uh, with? The children that we work in, uh, with in MCF, they are mainly street children, orphaned children, you know, child mothers, destitute, children with disabilities, all the children who are disadvantaged. And right now we have about 4% uh, of our children who we take care of are actually positive and they live full lives. We do not discriminate. We give them healthy lives. We give them uh, medical help and all that. So how I told you about the poverty levels in Kenya are, are quite alarming. And those are some of the slums uh, in Kenya, wherever we don't have, there's no sanitary uh, sanitation, there's no clean water. That is a family house right there of this family there. And these three children are currently in Muli children's family, whereby we provide also for the family. We go back to the community because you can't just take a child. You have to be mindful of the, of the, of the parents so that we stop the, the children going to the streets, becoming beggars. Like Dr. Muli, he was a beggar. He was a street child for many years. When he was abandoned at seven years old by his parents, he became a street child for all those years until he became 16 years old, and then he went and got a job. So we work with uh, all these manner of children, Children who live in the garbage bins and garbage uh, dumps, I'm sure you're uh, very well familiar with, with such scenarios. Then we had spoken about why they get to the streets. And then um, when they come to MCF, how do we nurture their talent? Remember, for anybody to be able to function properly fast, 
you have to be well in their mind, health-wise. We bring them, we have a dispensary in all our, our premises. So we make sure that they are healthy. We make sure that we have doctors, nurses, because how do you even uh, have a child not disturbed? How do you nurture a gift, a talent? How do you bring it out if a child is sick? if a child is psychologically not well. So that is what we give them. One of the reasons why we teach the young girls confidence, self-confidence, and we give them uh, sanitary pads, of which I'm sure this is very common in very many areas, whereby if you have to have the wellness of the person, the children that we deal with, first of all is that we provide sanitary pads for all the girls. This may look like a, just a normal thing, but in most poor of the poorest, they can't access that. And what happens? They go into prostitution so that they can earn money to buy sanitary pads. And in the process, they get sick, they get children, and the cycle keeps uh, going on. We not only work with Muli children's family in the giftedness and the talent development, we work with various community schools. Right now, we have over 40 schools that are under Muli Children's Family, whereby whatever we have learned, giving them spaces for them to, to know who they are. Because if, if a child or a young person has to discover anything that is inside them, they have to discover who they are first. They have to be mentally stable. You have to teach them the good morals. We teach them all manner of things that teenagers do face. So we work with community schools. We work with them. They come also, we have our clinics are open for even the community because the children, remember, the well-being of the children in MCF, the ones that you have picked from the streets or rescued them from difficulties, we have to mind also about their families, where they come from, some of them. And that is why we offer health services to the communities. We have volunteers who come, and I can tell you for sure, if we have to work and change this world, we need each other. We need different skill sets from everyone. And that is how we've been able to, and what we do is that, like this young girl here, she wants to be a nurse and she wants actually to do medical courses. So when these international um, doctors come in Muli Children's Family, we link all the children in different aspects. If you want to be a doctor, well, come and do some internship, come and do, come and work. If you want to be a farmer, well, we have a farm come and work there. So we have the communities who also come. And what we do is that we have open space for children to mentor each other, eat nutritious food, you know, laugh. And at the same time, we have them making uh, programs or joking or creating uh, dramas for one another. And they play, you know, you have to have a safe haven for these children. Now, when it comes to talent development or identification, you find that there are those ones who are very good in mathematics, you know, sciences, academic wise. So we, we actually encourage them. Those ones who are so good and we know these ones will definitely be an architecture. This one is very good in math. This one is very good in physics. So what do we do? We nurture them. We have all our schools, very good um, trained teachers. And the interesting thing is that once every person, once every child finishes grade 12, we, they become their peer mentors. They also go and start teaching in the school. They become social workers, they help the younger uh, persons. So there are those ones who have gone to school and gone through the system and they have been able to discover their giftedness, their talents in different areas. 
while us, we also train them on skill set. And all these things are open to them. Are you a good designer? Do you want to make, it? okay, fine, you can be a designer, fine. How about we go to the, to, the, to the tailoring room and then you try and design a dress and they make clothes for their younger brothers and sisters. So that really helps them discover their passion because without a driven passion, then how do we get the skills and the gifts out? Others are very good in hairdressing. We encourage them to do their hair, you know, to do each other's hair. And on top of that, we bring the Kenya system of uh, education. We have trainings whereby they do exams and they pass and they get certificates. So those ones who are not very good in academic, you know, wise, and they are good with their hands, we encourage them. Like that young man, he's artistic. He has such a creative mind in designing woodwork, in metalwork. So stone cutting or stone dressing, they graduate, as I said, and then we also give them certificates and help them start up because there's that aspect of reintegrating them back into the community. When they come to Muli Children's Family at a very tender age, like the little boy that we saw earlier on, we always help them know that one day they will need to go back to the community. One day their families, if they have families, they will depend on them. And some others, it's amazing that they have become, they have opened uh, children homes. They say, I want to be like Daddy Muli and Mommy Esther. So what are they doing? They are rescuing now street children and vulnerable children. And it is so amazing. It's just so uh, amazing. When it comes to sports, when we encourage them, those ones who are good in acrobats, soccer, our soccer team, young people right now, are competing in the National uh, Super League. That means they are only one step before they actually get into the Premier League of our country. So those ones, the young man you're seeing here, we rescued him when he was seven years old. He's a total orphan and he was in a children's prison or a children's juvenile. And right now, he's one of the highest scorer in the Muli uh, MCF football club. We teach them karate. There's all that, all those are children watching each other, cheering one another. Right now, we have four girls who have been selected or chosen to represent Kenya in the Olympics, in, in Tokyo Olympics. And you find that the ones who have gone before, they have become teachers. Some of them have become teachers in, in acrobats, teachers in music, teachers in karate, and they have their own clubs out there. So it's just amazing what, what, what is happening. Athletics. We have one young man who is joining the Kenya Olympic team in, in uh, running. So soon enough, we'll be cheering. And where did they discover all this? In Muli Children's Family. They need, we give every child an opportunity to explore, to explore their talent, whichever area, because you never know, it's hard to know who is gifted in what. So we give them the opportunity to go as far as concerned, to give them, those ones are, are our choirs. We have over 10 choirs in MCF because out of this, in the Kenyan industry, music industry, we have a lot of children from Muli children's family. Now they are all grown up and they are able to produce their own music. They have become, they have become influence, influencers. Others are in the entertainment industry. Others have become news anchors. You know, they have become doctors, engineers, and it's just, it's, it's wonderful when you see them. We have, of course, sustainability projects and all that, but then uh, for now I'll stop sharing. And then I, I quickly um, uh, mention uh, something else. Uh, 
just one moment, please. And what we do is that we have agriculture. Agriculture, how does it, um, how does agriculture, oh, you can ask agriculture, giftedness and talent, how does it come in? We have farms. And I, as I mentioned, one of the ways is bringing them into, we give, we have mentors. So we have peer mentors and we have actually teachers and pastors and we have counselors who mentor these children into the different levels or different gifts that they may have. We have them who are, some who are interested in agriculture. So they help out in supervising, in learning and become farmers, wonderful people with excellent uh, ideas on, on, on farming. So we have that, we produce our own uh, vegetables, you know, some are for export, some are for local, um, local uh, consumption in our home. Why do we do this? Where, where do those two link in? Because once they see, children love seeing things. They love imitating things. Once you tell them things, they be, it becomes real for them. So others have become cooks. They have, they, they help in the kitchen. They help in the, the farms that we do. And then on climate change, we also encourage them to plant trees. We have a whole area of trees in our farmland. What, like I am, uh, like Dr. Um, Na, Naya, Narayan, he says his, his gift is in nature and in forest and everything. So we are encouraging them to discover, actually, you can be able to take care of our environment. And some of them have a passion in knowing about animals. Others want to know more about trees. So Dr. Muli, he, we, we work, as I said, we work with different schools in our region. We bring them together and teach them how to plant trees. And therefore, we have a forest that we have planted and we've planted many, many millions of trees and encourage people all around the world. So not only are we encouraging, what happens is that if we don't encourage young people in taking care of the environment, if we only think maybe the gifts and the talents are only in academics or so, who is going to take care of our, our climate? Who is going to take care of our nature? Who is going to, so this is Muli Children's Family Yata, the whole of that that you're seeing. Those are man-made dams, we constructed them. So they are young people who also drive the machines. All our machinery is actually uh, operated by our children, our former, former, you know, the ones who have graduated maybe from grade 12 and all that. So they're the ones who do all this work and it creates an opportunity for them to get employment. So we are creating opportunity employment opportunities for the for our own children who have now become adults at the same time teaching them their passion because passion is also very important as you consider we had spoken about the this is the other area of the country um trukana we have our base there and these are the challenges that have made us go into agriculture because one of the ways we have discovered of discovering, of evoking that talent, evoking that, uh, that giftedness out of a child or out of a person is showing them there is a need, helping them, provoking them to think, how do you solve a problem? And through that, we've seen actually, that is flooding, we've seen them coming up with ideas and a passion and discovering what their, actually their talents are. Remember, I spoke about uh, locusts in Kenya, flooding in Kenya. 
which has been really a big challenge. And then the COVID-19, it's, it's just amazing. And now we've been able to teach the children being philanthropic. When we are giving food to the communities because of the hunger, because of the drought, we give them also, we have the children, the older ones come and distribute food to the communities. All these people are coming to Muli Children's Family to receive food from us. And those are some of the kids who come from the village and we give them food to go and be able to prepare. So food distribution in the different uh, set of schools, we give them food to make sure that we don't only want to benefit in Muli Children's Family alone, but what about the surrounding area? What about the surrounding schools? So that they continue, as I said, we have a mentorship program. We not only help them discover their talents, discover all that, but we also give them food to ensure that they stay in school and they learn. Water is important. You cannot affect a community properly if you're not providing clean water, if you're not providing um, education for them. That is all water, giving water. And then coronavirus, you know, it's been a challenge uh, for each and every one of us. So we distribute not only for our children, but also now. These ones were made by our own children. They made um, masks and we distributed to the communities. We distributed everywhere. And somebody has earned a living out of that. So the ones who wanted to be designers, not only are they designing, you know, um, uh, what are they called, um, masks, but they're also earning a living. So yes, I'll stop there for now. And uh, thank you, thank you, uh, thank you very much. And thank you also, and congratulations for all these things. We really learned a lot. How you can make your uh, program for this special population fit to your own country or own society, own uh, uh, natural environment as well, and also how you grow uh, social responsibility um, and many, many other important things, not just cognitive development. We remained a very, very short time. So what we can do that I ask uh, all of you to give some advices for those people who deal with uh, similar population uh, in their countries, children in extreme, uh, gifted children in extreme uh, danger and poverty. So Narayan, what would you suggest to your colleagues uh, uh, who live and work, uh, work abroad with this population? What did you learn from your own program? Uh, the first and foremost learning which I have is um, uh, not to base everything on academic performance. So if we can develop something non-academic, so then more gifted people, students can enjoy that. Uh, the second thing which is very important that if you come up with, some, with your own indigenous model, it's always uh, academician and educationist people try to bring other model, try to adapt and modify. But you are fit and you are capable of developing your own model. I'm certainly in uh, uh, good terms with other models to learn from their models, but one has to come with an indigenous model because the kids will be more culturally and socially attached with what we are teaching, you know. For example, in tribal Mensa, most of the girls and boys, gifted kids, that our concentration is not happening when we are doing some schooling and other things. And in indigenous, in Sanskrit, old literature, how to concentrate mind, there are some stanzas. And I said, okay, if you chant these stanzas every day, early morning, 108 times, your concentration will increase. And we have scientifically proven how the kids can improve its concentration. So rather than talking something more philosophical and more scientific, if you have come with a small ritualistic cultural based activities, it always help uh, a gifted kid. Uh, it is one. Thank you very much. And Shaila, the same question to you. Well, um, as 
living in Latin American country and having the need to adapt and readapt to different circumstances, I would say find your voice to speak up and never give up. Okay, I think this is a good summary of I would tell anybody who would like to go ahead and give the dedication because this is challenging, but it's up to you to give up or not or go ahead. Yes. Yes, very challenging. And thank you for your advices. And uh, uh, Nondo, the same question to you. So your suggestions to colleagues who work with similar population in their own countries? I will, I will tell them not to give up and to seek to, to give when uh, um, it's possible, to give as many opportunities as possible for their children or young people, then they can choose. And you see, it's, it's, it's very interesting that uh, Dr. Rampel from IUBS, Dr. David Rampel from IUBS, he did a research in, 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 uh, in Muli Children's Family. He's written something. And one of the things that he, he mentioned is that actually you need mentors for the children to be able to succeed. We need, we need people who go forward and help the children become confident. And these young people, when they are in that platform of decision making, when they when they flourish, they they are the ones who are coming who are going to come up with the best uh, education system. They're going to come up with the best products for even giftedness and talent development. It's like finding uh, you have to get that uh, diamond in the rough. You have to look for it. So these are our diamonds. These disadvantaged children, disadvantaged persons are our diamonds. We need to find them, give them a, uh, an opportunity for them to, to be able to flourish and they'll give us the best, the best um, way forward. So thank you very much. We also thank you. And I think you all do a beautifully, beautiful and very uh, variable work in your uh, country, in your program. But for these children, this is more than something beautiful because this is about these gifted children's lives. You give lives for them. So on behalf of these children, I also want to thank you to take part in this roundtable discussion. Thank you very much and good luck in the future. Thank you, Janos. Thank you so much. Thank you, Janos. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think it will be a nice and interesting uh, program in this uh, uh, conference. And thank you for coming. And uh, I really enjoyed. Technically, it was really, really very uh, good and very useful. The slides were very, very meaningful. So thank you for all your preparation. And we have learned a lot of in interesting things about uh, uh, gifted education for this uh, special population with children in extreme poverty and needs uh, uh, from India, uh, from Kenya, and from Peru. So thank you really very much.